Okay, welcome everybody to um, Disability Teaches Us, Reframing Possibilities, Meaningful Inclusion, Undoing Ableism in Schools. We're so thrilled that you're here. We are recording um, today's meeting, so um, please be mindful of that. And we're gonna get started. So today's presentation is utilizing a meeting format. CART services are available. Chat, the chat feature is also available, and we're going to use this for attendance check-in for clock hours and responding to questions. Um, please note that private chat really isn't truly private. We can see those messages at the end of the meeting. And yeah, and we'll get started. Um, for using Zoom, for those who might be less familiar, you can open the chat at the bottom of the toolbar. And as mentioned, we do have live remote cart available today. Those folks who would like to view captions, you can click um, on the Zoom menu bar and activate live transcript from the closed caption icon. If that doesn't work for you, you can also access captions from using a link, which will take you to a separate web browser. All right, so we're going to get started. If you haven't already, please feel free to introduce yourself using the chat function. And again, that's by using, using the chat um, at the bottom of the screen. You can select everyone, um, and those messages can be seen. Um, you can also just choose to send it again to host, the host or co-host. Please share your name, your role, what city or school district you're in. And also please take a moment to just ground yourself and take, you know, make this space accessible for you. Again, we are recording this meeting. So you're, um, it is up to you if you want to share your video or not. And we'll go ahead and introduce ourselves. So my name is Jen Chong Jewel. My pronouns are she, her, and I have a dog in the background and this, and my son walking around. Um, I am with PAVE and I'm also with the Family Engagement Collaborative, which is part of the Inclusionary Practices Project. Um, I have long, brown, wavy, dark hair. I am of um, European and Asian descent and I am wearing a black v-neck sweater today and I have a white curtain in my background. I'm going to pass it over to Taina. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Taina Karolsen. For, uh, I'm one of the directors at Inclusion for All um, and a parent of a disabled kid. Um, and uh, I am a white woman in my early 40s. Um, I have bleach blonde uh, short hair or shortest hair. Um, I wear glasses and I'm wearing a navy top and behind me is a uh, very packed bookcase and I'm going to pass this on to Jinju. Good afternoon, my name is Jinju Park. I am Senior Education Ombuds at the Governor's Office of the Education Ombuds. I am a middle-aged Asian woman with shoulder length purple hair and glasses sitting in front of a blue wall wearing a gray sweater. Uh, I'm going to let Jen get this started. Thank you. So I would like to just take a moment to do a land acknowledgement. Um, this afternoon, we take a moment to honor America's first people and all elders, past, present, and emerging. And we are called on to learn and share what we learn about the tribal history, culture, and contributions that have been suppressed in the telling the story of America. In the area where I live, I am on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish, who have been um, the stewards for the, these lands since time immemorial. If you would like to participate in this land acknowledgement, feel free to drop in the chat where you are situated. Thank you. Okay, so before we dive in, um, I would like us just to take a moment to have a collective breath. Um, in this moment, it's the late afternoon of Thursday, April 28th, and I'd like to acknowledge that at any given moment, there's so much that is happening in our lives that impacts us, and um, 
like I said, my son is home from school and he's currently shooting baskets. I will talk to him in just a moment. But, you know, it's just to acknowledge that we all have um, very packed lives. And I'm so glad that you're joining us today. And if you're watching this um, in a later recording, thank you for taking the time to do that. Um, earlier, we asked you to, to identify yourself by your role, but, you know, we know that as we're focusing on making things better for our young people today, no one is defined by a single identity or role. So we are in community, we are in this together, and within us, we have the tools to make things better for everybody. Thank you. So I'm gonna take a moment to go over our learning goals for today. Um, in this series with Dr. Lavani, this is the third of um, three learning opportunities. In this opportunity, we're gonna look at um, and question the silences around disability when it comes to K-12 curricula. We're going to explore the socio-cultural model of disability. We're gonna gain an introduction to the concept of ableism. We're going to learn and recognize um, ableist content in cultural products and children's literature. We're gonna consider using literature that invites children and youth to rethink society's construction of normalcy understand disability as a natural form of variation, and also develop an appreciation and value for all forms of human diversity. And we'll have resources available for you at the end of that. And again, you know, this is connected to a series that's available on the Office of the Education Ombuds website, Disability Teaches Us. And this is the last in the series, currently undoing ableism in schools. Again, this work is funded for, um, by the OSPI Inclusionary Practices Project. Uh, so to support a more inclusive um, school environment in Washington, the state legislature in 2019 provided OSPI with $25 million for the 2019-21 biennium and $12 million for the 21 to 23 biennium to provide educators with professional development opportunities in support, in support of inclusionary practices across the state. Uh, when this project began, Washington was one of the least inclusive states, one of the bottom 10 um, in the nation. And while Washington has made some strides um, in the last few years, we continue to remain in the bottom half. So at this moment, I'd like to introduce you to our presenter, Dr. Priya Lavani. Dr. Lavani is a professor at Montclair State University. She teaches courses in disability studies and is the coordinator for graduate programs and inclusive education. She holds a PhD in developmental psychology. Her research is focused on examining the way society and politics affects the experiences of individuals with disabilities and their families. Through her research, she seeks to confront ableism in schools, in society, and to highlight the problems of dividing students based on their abilities, which results in the widespread segregation of many students with disabilities in schools. She is the editor of Constructing the Mother, Narratives of Disability, Motherhood, and the Politics of Normal, and co-author of Undoing Ableism, Teaching About Disability in K-12 Classrooms. Um, thank you, Dr. Priya Lavani, for joining us. Thank you so much, Jen, for that introduction. I'm delighted to be back here again today. Um, some of you may have joined one of my past two webinars. Um, in this today's session, as Jen said, we're going to do some cover some a little bit different topics, such as um, ableism in schools, um, identifying cultural products that are ableist in nature and so forth. But um, as I do uh, have done for the last two webinars, will uh, or, or workshops or sessions uh, as whatever these are, um, I'd like to start again by grounding ourselves in an understanding of inclusive education um, in the ways that I, I will be discussing it. Um, so there's umpteen ways 
of interpreting um, or defining inclusive education. This is by no means the ultimate and only definition or the official definition, but um, I like to use this operational working definition of inclusive education because um, it sort of derives from a justice-based perspective. So I'll just read it. Um, the philosophy and practice of educating diverse students in classrooms, which are heterogeneous in terms of ethnicity, class, culture, gender identity, ability and disability, and other identity markers using strategies that are responsive to each student's strengths and needs. So um, I always like to point out that inclusive education is both a philosophy and a practice. It's a mindset, it's a way of approaching the world, um, but it's at its you know, most fundamental level a practice. It's what we do. Um, and what sticks out to me with this definition is that it's not about disability primarily. It's really about teaching all students, teaching any student, regardless of any group identity that they may have. Um, and it's not inclusive education if we're not using strategies that are responsive to each student's strengths and needs. So it's not about putting a child with a disability um, alongside other children and calling it inclusive. So I just like to start with that. Thank you, um, Dr. Labani, for clarifying that. And you know, just to bring you back to the Washington context and Washington data, because one way to look at it is, you know, looking at what's called least restrictive environment. Um, it is the time that's calculated that students with disabilities spend in general education settings. So you can see in um, least restrictive environment one, 80 to 100 percent of the time, 57.7% um, of all students with disabilities are placed in these settings, while 54.5% of students with color, of color with disabilities are placed in these settings. In LRE2, 40 to 79% of the time, 38.4% of all students with disabilities are placed in general education settings while 31.1% of students of color with disabilities are placed in those settings. And in LRE3, for zero to 39% of the time, 12.4% of all students with disabilities are placed in those settings, while 13.3% of students of color with disabilities are placed in these settings. So again, it's one measure, it's not, um, comprehensive of all that is happening in general education settings to know if it's truly inclusive. It's really the floor of opportunity that um, students with disabilities have to have access to the general education content and those um, learning environments. And, um, for, and then for Washington State, the, these data is for um, five-year-olds in kindergarten up to um, 12th grade. So, and Jen, um, I'll, I'll add that the, these data are very consistent with, with national data as well um, across many, if not most states. Um, students of color are overrepresented in the most segregated settings and underrepresented in the least restrictive settings. So that is worthy of note. Um, okay, so I'll dive into today's content. And um, so I've got this little, oh, I, I didn't do an audio uh, description of myself. I'm sorry, I, um, I'm, Jen introduced me, but I should say my pronouns are she, her, and I'm sitting um, before a background of uh, like a wallpaper with hummingbirds and some plants behind me. I am a South Asian woman with dark brown hair to my shoulders, wearing black um, glasses and a wine colored shirt um, and a black um, tank top underneath. Okay, let me get back to it. So basically, um, I wanna just take a moment to note that today um, across social justice education circles, at least, 
um, because this is an interesting point to be even saying this where there's many states that uh, have passed laws to you know not discuss race or or gender or all of that so this is a very historical moment first of all with curriculum um, but within social justice educators there is um, a growing and has been a growing acknowledgement of the need to infuse anti-bias curricula in schools right um, and even within that world even within social justice education often one finds that the topic of disability is not included so even in the progressive agendas of social justice education, I'm not even talking about the rest of it, right? Um, even there, there tends to be a silence around the topic of disability in schools. And when I say silence around the topic of disability in schools, I don't mean special education because there's conversation about that. I mean the topic of disability as a topic within our K-12 curriculum to be discussed with children that generally tends to be omitted. Go to the next slide, Jen. Yeah, Dr. Lavani, do you want to say anything about the comic here? Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> yes, so I have, um, sorry about that. Um, I have a little cartoon on this slide and it's, uh, it's like a courtroom and there is an elephant sitting in the, uh, in the witness box and the, uh, he's being cross-examined by the attorney who says to the elephant, if you were in the middle of the room the whole time, why can we not find a single witness to corroborate your testimony? Um, and the title of the slide is the elephant in the room. And I like to use that because disability tends to be the elephant in the room in our classrooms, in schools. Sometimes you see it, you, you notice it, uh, but nobody is going to mention it. So let's just take a moment for the collective history of people with disabilities. And, and this is something that we don't always think about, but people with disabilities are actually um, an identity group. Right, they are a historically marginalized, historically oppressed minority group. Um, they actually have a collective history that may include a whole bunch of things, including institutionalization, eugenics, mass incarceration, the freak shows. Um, there, these are just some, some points in history. Um, at many times, historically, this is a group that has been denied even the most basic of human rights. More recently, we've seen the emergence of the disability rights movement, um, and that has been aimed at challenging the oppression of people with disabilities and claiming access to inclusivity in all aspects of community and schools. So we've got this history of a group of people, right? A rich history, yet this collective history remains largely outside the public consciousness. Um, many educators are unaware of it, and I'm a teacher educator, so I, I work with teachers every day, and I teach disability history, um, and many teachers, in, in fact most, um, say that they never really learned this in school. This is, this is new to them. They're working in schools, they're working with people with disabilities, and they've never been aware that this is a group that has a history. Our American history textbooks typically do not include any mention of disability history, disability rights movement, the emergence of disability culture, um, the eugenics movement uh, is often mentioned in, um, in connection with the Holocaust as well it should be, um, but not usually mentioned specifically um, in, in its relationship with disability and our treatment of people with disabilities. So one thing that, um, and there's many things at the root of this, we could talk all night about that, but I just wanna talk about this one idea. There's this discourse, um, this rhetoric in schools, if you will, that um, children, and not just in schools, I should say, in society, um, I hear parents saying it, I hear people saying it in general, teachers, um, you know, children, especially young children, they're innocent, they're pure, they don't even notice any different. Um, they, they don't see anything. They, they haven't asked any questions because they just don't see disability. 
Um, so this idea that not noticing disability, it's supposed to be a good thing, apparently. Um, it's considered to be an unbiased way of relating to students or to, to people, right? You just don't look, you don't look, you don't stare, you don't mention it, you don't say anything. We're such good people, we didn't even mention it. Um, it's a very similar actually to colorblind ideology. People are familiar with that maybe. This claim that um, we don't notice color, we don't notice race. Um, it's not polite to mention it, and it's not even okay to notice it. So this idea that we don't notice disability is problematic, and it's as problematic as saying that one doesn't notice race. Um, among critical race theorists, actually not noticing the claim that we don't notice race um, is understood as rooted in, in racism, right, in implicit bias. Um, so similarly, this idea of saying that we don't notice somebody's disability and ch or children don't notice it is also connected in some way to ableism. And I'm going to talk about that idea in, in just a minute. Um, but on the other hand, um, some other teachers have expressed um, that, they, that they'd want to talk about it, but they feel concerned or anxious or they're just not prepared. So a lot of the teachers that I work with say that they want to but they're just not sure how, what's the right way to do it or, or are they even supposed to do it? So are they supposed to do it? Should they do it? These are great questions and why should they do it, right? Why are we here talking about infusing disability within our K-12 curriculum? Um, for one, People with disabilities are the largest minority group in the, in the United States. And it's a group that has been historically marginalized, oppressed and denied rights and has a history, as I said before. Um, people with disabilities are around us, they're everywhere. I mean, they're a part of our everyday lives, whether we actually know it or not. Um, they make contributions to society. They have a vibrant disability culture. So for all of those reasons, of course, we should acknowledge it. But more disturbing and more concerning to me as an educator is that when we leave it unmentioned, when we don't mention the word or when we don't acknowledge the existence of a group of people, it suggests it signals to non-disabled people, children in particular in schools, like it's not a topic we talk about, therefore, it has no relevance to my life, right? Um, people with disabilities also just become invisible. Nobody mentions it, no one acknowledges it. Um, and most importantly, not talking about it reifies the idea that disability oppression does not exist. And I have argued in, in much of my writing that not mentioning disability within our curriculum is a form of oppression in itself. To not mention disability oppression and to not teach about it is constitutes a form of disability oppression. So let's take on that, um, that belief that I had mentioned that uh, a lot of uh, people in our society have this idea that children are innocent, they don't notice differences. In fact, um, when we look at developmental research, when we look at um, the research on prejudice, we, we see that children, contrary to our beliefs, actually do notice differences. And quite frankly, why would they not? I mean, differences are not a bad thing. Children are curious. They notice that people are different around us. They look different. They are different in their size, their color, their shape, the way they dress, their preferences. Um, they notice differences. It's a good thing to notice differences, but when teachers claim, and I've had many teachers um, claim that the reason why they believe that is because their children never asked any questions about it. When children don't openly ask, it doesn't mean they haven't noticed differences. It means they've internalized society's message. They've, in, they've internalized the constructed hierarchies and they've come to understand which differences it's not okay to mention. So in that they've internalized society's understanding of race, of disability, and soon they pick up through the ways in which adults react to them by shushing them, Shh, don't mention it, don't look, don't stare, 
don't, right? Um, they come to understand that while there are all these differences, certain things we don't mention. So in fact, we should be rethinking this. Um, young children with and without disabilities, all kids could be invited to consider society's response to disability. And we need to give them the tools and the language, teachers as well. Teachers, once they have it, then can invite children by giving them the tools and the language to understand all forms of oppression and to recognize all forms of marginalized identities and to position themselves as agents of change. So at the root of some of what I've been talking about is something that I call, well, I don't call it, able, is ableism um, and, the, uh, and the omission or the absence of dialogue about disability is also rooted in ableism. And I'm gonna talk about what that is in a second. So ableism, some of you might have heard of it. Some of you maybe have come to my last session. I talked about it there as well. For those of you who are new to this term, ableism basically refers to a devaluing of disability and people with disabilities. It refers to a viewpoint in which disability is understood as an inherently and unequivocally negative state of being. Something we do not want to have, to have around us, we want to have it fixed, to be, have it removed, to have it eliminated, to have it prevented at all costs, right? So we live in a society in which we have privileges that are enjoyed by able-bodied people, and those privileges are upheld. And what do I mean by those privileges held by able-bodied people? I mean that the world is constructed in a way that works for some bodies. Certain bodies, our structures, our buildings, the ways in which things are arranged, the lighting, the sound, the ways in which we communicate. Our schools are set up in ableist ways as well. We've set up ways of sitting, ways of demonstrating that you've understood something, ways of teaching. All of those are rooted in able-bodied ways of doing things. So they work for some people, for most people, granted, right? Um, so that's what we mean by able-bodied privilege. Um, and ableism, the simplest way of understanding it is I like when I'm explaining it to somebody, I'll say, you know, it's, it's analogous to the other isms. So racism, sexism, and so forth. Um, just like the other isms, it originates in a belief about the inherent superiority of certain groups. Um, it also originates in fear, fear of the unknown, fear of different groups, um, and just not knowing. But it's damaging because it unfolds as a pervasive system of oppression at three different levels. There's the individual level, is how a person thinks and, and feels their own beliefs. At the cultural level, you see, and then the most damaging is at the institutional level, um, which encompasses the policies, the laws, and so forth. Um, while I said it's like the other isms, in one way I argue that it is not like the other isms. This one is largely outside the public consciousness. Okay, most people have still, you know, not it's not it's not entered the widespread public consciousness, which is why I'm defining it right now. I suppose. Um, it remains what some people call a permissible prejudice. Um, and by that, um, Chadaro um, is a scholar who coined that and says that while in, even in progressive, um, I guess the word is woke groups, um, where certain things would absolutely not be considered acceptable, ableist comments remain permissible in that people are not aware of, of what these are. So really quickly, um, I, uh, I want to put this out there because in, um, in the field of disability studies, there are two models that are discussed, right? Two models, two ways of understanding the phenomenon of disability. If uh, it might be easier to understand as two schools of thought, right? Um, so there's the medical model, which is on the left side of the screen here, and the social model. The medical model is your traditional dominant way 
um, that we've been thinking of disability for generations or, or decades or centuries. Um, in this way of thinking, disability is understood as an objective reality. It just is. It's something that someone diagnoses. Um, it's a result of the impairment. It is outside the norm. In the medical model, the source of the problem, in, in quotes, is located within the individual, meaning there's a problem. The problem is the disability. The disability is that you can't hear slash see slash walk slash learn, right? The, that is identified as the problem. So therefore that has to be fixed, eliminated or cured. Um, disability is understood as resulting in a lesser quality of life. Um, so this model fails to take into account the contexts within which people actually live. In contrast, let's look at the right side of the screen. In the social model, um, disability is viewed as a social construct. Um, in that we mean that it results from the interaction between impairments and environmental barriers. So in other words, disability is not just a person's impairment. It's the way that impairment interacts with levels of access in the environment, with attitudes in the environment, right? How society um, responds, if you will, to that disability. In the social model, we question the idea of normalcy itself. We reject normalcy. Now here, the problem, in quotes, is not solely the impairment. The problem is also societal attitudes and obstacles and lack of access and lack of, um, and lack of accommodations and lack of acceptance and inclusivity in society. So you can see that this is a very different way of looking at disability. Within this model, people with disabilities are also viewed as cultural identity and as a historically marginalized and oppressed group. So the focus here is not on fixing people, but fixing society. Okay, so we're gonna look at, um, I'll explain it. So there's, a, there's a, a tool that people use in order to analyze whether things are ableist. Um, and we use something called master narratives and counter narratives, right? Uh, and that's, by the way, a, a broad tool, not, not just for analyzing ableist content, but almost anything, right? Um, what is a master narrative? A master narrative, a simple way of thinking of it is a dominant way of thinking, the predominant way of thinking. Um, the ways of thinking that have been unquestioned, taken for granted, they just have been assumed to be the truth, common sense, unquestioned ways and beliefs, right? So what are the cultural master narratives, master narratives, um, ways of thinking about disability? One is disability is something to be overcome, prevented, or cured, right? So this is an example of that's just how people think. That's how it has been. It's always been. Of course, disability needs to be overcome, prevented, or cured. Um, people with disabilities are deserving of our charity. We feel sorry for people with disabilities, right? Everything in this list um, are ways of thinking that have gone unchallenged for a long time. We see people with disabilities, we think, oh, God bless you, or wow, I can't imagine what life must be like, or we feel sorry for them, we feel pity for them. Another thing that happens is uh, disability as tragedy. Um, a common refrain in society is better dead than disabled. You got people that think, you know, like, wow, if that happened to me, I would sooner be dead. So that, so that sentiment, um, disability as tragedy, tragic outcome, to have a child with a disability as the most tragic, un, undesirable thing um, that is upheld in our society. Um, people with disabilities seen as angelic, childlike, innocent, people with disabilities as inspirational. I can bet that everybody here has had that moment where they've come across, uh, you know, inspirational stories like, wow, this blind person climbed this mountain and that little girl with Down syndrome went to the prom and what an inspirational story. It makes us feel good. It makes us feel like better people.
Now, when we look at the counter narratives of people with disabilities, we find very different themes. And what are counter narratives? Um, they are the stories, narratives of people with disabilities um, that are generally in opposition, um, or rather they, they push back, they resist. They are different stories. They tell a different story. So when we look at the counter narratives of people with disabilities, we find actually none of those things in the previous slide, right? Usually we don't find inspiration and pity and life as tragedy. We find in their stories, themes of resistance to otherness, a pushback, a need to, to, to sort of say, I am not other, right? Um, an effort to redefine normalcy, a questioning of normalcy. You also see a reclaiming of language and a, and a claiming of the history of disability. Um, you see a highlighting, not of the impairment, but of the social and attitudinal barriers. So when you look at the stories, the counter stories of disabled activists, you see that they will highlight not the, not the impairment, but, they, but the highlight that the, they shed light on the fact that they live in a society where they are denied access, where there are negative attitudes, where there is prejudice, where there are stereotypes, where there is discrimination. In their stories, these are what pop. Um, yeah, and oh, the last bullet is that in, in counter narratives of people with disabilities, ableism is positioned as the primary problem for the group. So here's something that we want to consider as educators, as educators here, there might be parents here. Um, how is disability represented in the cultural products that we consume every day? What are cultural products? Films, TV, um, print media, advertisements, books, social media, children's literature, right? All of these and many more are our cultural products. What we, and we are consumers of cultural products. So we wanna, we first want to become critical consumers. That's what the phrase that I like to use. Um, we wanna be critical consumers in that we just consuming all this stuff, but we wanna start looking at in what ways do those ableist master narratives that I just listed get reinforced through our media, through our literature, through our language, through our images, through our advertising all around us. Uh, and then we want to invite children to become critical consumers of what they are consuming and to be able to spot oppressive content um, and to, to sort of look through a social justice lens at what they are consuming. So when we are looking at cultural products, um, here's sort of a, a handy guide. There's, there's many, but uh, we can ask ourselves these things. First of all, from whose perspective does this originate, right? Whether it's a, a film, a movie, a TV show you saw, um, a billboard about something really inspirational. So you wanna ask yourself like who's created this and have people with disabilities had input? in what went on here. What master narratives are present? Um, just to recap, like, does it have uh, something inspirational? Does it show that disability is a tragedy? Does it show that disability must be cured? Are there any counter narratives that are present in this? And if so, what is it really telling us about disability? So looking at any product, um, we wanna ask ourselves, how does this promote or disrupt ableism? Why is it doing it? How is it doing it? And let's look at some common tropes, right? Some themes, some stereotypical ideas about people with disabilities that come up in, um, in media and children's literature. So traditionally, people with disabilities have been depic depicted in all of these ways. And when you, I mean, things are absolutely changing um, I know when I was growing up, I, there were certainly none of these the books that, that are available today, but you know, you had your, your Grimm's fairy tales and your, all of those stuff. But when you think about traditional literature, particularly, and even today, 
people with disabilities are often one of these things. So one trope is object of fear, sinister, scary, villain, the bad guy. Um, if you notice, often in traditional children's literature, um, there are people with facial deformities or scars. Um, there's your Captain Hook with the hook hand. I mean, Captain Hook is an amputee, but he's scary, right? He's a villain. Um, you've got the guy in the wheelchair in Nightmare Before Christmas. And, and you know, there's, there's many, many examples that you can, I'm sure, all think of. Um, this idea also comes up as um, people as potentially violent, unpredictable, scary. Then alternatively, you can go the other extreme. People with disabilities are also portrayed as objects of pity or innocent or deserving of compassion and kindness, right? You've got your tiny Tim in the, the Christmas, I think, was it a Christmas Carol? Um, and you've got this really sweet, pathetic um, characters in Heidi and Little Women. Um, they're sort of, you know, insipid and, and sweet and, and you know, like childlike almost. Then you've got the, uh, the laughable trope, the bumbling fool, the comedic character, the, the person with the stutter or the lisp. Um, you've got your Elmer Fudds and your Tweety Birds and you know, the, the speech impediments. Then you've got your stereotypical genius abilities, right? Um, if people are of my generation, uh, I recall Rain Man, anybody? Um, and you've got this, this idea of the person with a disability as being able to, you know, remember everything or do, do everything. And wow, so amazing. And then you've got your objects of curiosity, your odd sort of creatures. Um, and I'm thinking of uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, um, your Quasimodo, you know, just people that are kind of a little off. You know, nobody knows what, what they quite are, right? Let's go to the next slide. And then you've got these common themes that show up in cultural products. Um, some of it I've, I've already talked about, but just to recap all of it, um, and there's a couple of new ones here. So you've got your overcoming disability theme, right? You've got your, this person, you know, wasn't able to, and he tried and tried and tried, and he overcame his disability. Um, and you see that in adult films quite a lot, but you've got to sort of know to spot it in children's books. And I'm thinking of Leo the Late Bloomer, which is a beloved children's book. And I, I love that book. I've always loved it too. But it's quite squarely within the overcoming disability category, right? Leo the Late Bloomer, he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. He couldn't learn. You're slow. But he tried and tried and tried, and there you go. It worked. He succeeded, and now he's just like us. Then you've got your disability as tragedy and burden to others. We've talked about that already. Um, life with a disability is not worth living. Um, is a frequent theme, particularly this one, you don't see it in children's books, obviously, but you do see it in adult films. Uh, Me Before You, Whose Life Is It Anyway? Um, and so on and so forth, where you've got a person um, who's disabled and they, they wanna die. So there's just that, that assumption that's reinforced in, in media. The redemption narrative is also present. And by that, I mean, um, the person with the disability is there to redeem the non-disabled person and make the non-disabled person a good, better, more empathetic person. Um, and I'm thinking of Rain Man again, where if anyone has seen that movie, I mean, so you've got Tom Cruise, who's, you know, this guy who's portrayed as a bit of, you know, an ass, if you will. And, um, you know, through his interactions with his brother, who's autistic, this guy learns to become a better person. So it's almost as if the disabled person is there for the non-disabled person to get karma points. <laughs> and to become even better, right? And then there's disability as punishment or as divine justice. So you've got, um, and in this dates back really far, um, people are punished with blindness 
there, actually the original Cinderella, the Grimm's version of Cinderella ends with the line, and so for their evil ways, the stepsisters had their eyes plucked out by doves and had to live the rest of their lives in blindness. So the message there is not subtle. It's, it's pretty straightforward to children, right? And so for the, their evil ways, they must live their lives in blindness. Disability is the punishment for evil doing. And then the worst, I think the, the biggest offender is none of those representations, but the fact that in the vast majority of media and cultural products in children's literature, disability is missing, it's absent, which I think does more damage than any of the others combined, just not there, invisible, they don't even make an appearance in the vast majority. So um, I guess that slide is there to let you know that if you um, wanna learn more about it or have more lessons on these kinds of issues and topics with lots of um, like practical sort of worksheets to do with children in classrooms, you'll find them in uh, my co-authored book, Undoing Ableism, co-authored with Susan Baglieri. It really walks us through all of it in much more detail. It has a lot of practical resources. Next slide, Jen. Okay, so uh, we're gonna take a moment and take a look at two different books. These books are actually available also on YouTube. So we're gonna watch them as a whole group um, today. And then we're gonna have some discussion over it. And um, Dinah has the handout available for you. I think she can drop it in the chat, which will allow you to download it. So I just realized we cannot do that. Oh, okay. I can copy paste it into the chat. I'll do that. Okay, thank you. Yes. So, you know, it's a handout that is designed to help you remember some of the, the themes that um, Dr. Lavani just talked about and use that as a guide to look at these two, two books that we're going to um, examine. So I'm going to pivot and transition to YouTube and we're going to look at the first one. It's called My Friend Has Autism and it will be read aloud to us. So just one moment as I get that set up and then- Can I just, can I just yeah. say again, as we're listening yeah. to it, um, we can just bear in mind some of the things that I just went over and like we can make mental notes, if you will, or, and, you know, just to see if anything pops and, or, you know, maybe it's, it's great and it's, it's a counter narrative um, or it's a master narrative um, and, and any of those tropes um, may appear or not. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Levani. So I'm going to um, do that. Just one moment. Okay, I'm going to play the video and make sure I share the sound so everyone can hear it. Here we go. My Friend Has Autism by Amanda Doring Tourville, illustrated by Kristen Sora. My name is Nick. This is my friend, Zach. Zach and I belong to a model airplane club. Zach has autism. Airplanes are awesome. Zach likes building bi-wing planes. Fighter jets are my favorites. Did you know autism is a brain-based disorder? With autism, parts of the brain don't grow the way they should. No one knows why some kids have autism. There is no cure yet. Zach knows a lot about airplanes. His nickname is Pilot. I've learned more about planes from Zach than from anybody else. Sometimes Zach goes on and on about airplanes. He repeats the same facts over and over. Did you know kids with autism have trouble communicating? They may not talk much at all. They may talk only about their interests, even when other people don't share those interests. It can seem like he's in his own world. 
When Zach is focused on his models, he may not talk to me at all. Did you know, many kids with autism are able to focus very tightly on an interest. We work on our own planes quietly, or I'll tell him about my day. I feel like I can tell Zach anything. Zach and I play video games while we wait for the glue to dry. He's tough to beat. Sometimes I think he lets me win. Zach hears things most people don't notice. Loud noises can hurt his ears. On our field trip to the airport, he wore the coolest earmuffs ever. He looked like he worked there. Did you know, many kids with autism may hear sounds or smell odors that other people don't notice. I wrestle with some of my other friends, but not with Zach. He feels things differently than most people. Zach doesn't like anybody touching him, not even to pin on his new wings. And that's okay. There are lots of things I don't like, too. When I go to Zach's house, I bring my own models. It bothers Zach when other people touch or play with his models. Each plane has to be in just the right spot. Did you know, kids with autism often spend a lot of time arranging toys or objects. It can upset them when someone moves their things. Zach may not look at me while I'm talking to him. Sometimes he walks away. Did you know, many kids with autism can seem impolite. They don't understand that it's rude to walk away from someone who is talking to them. I know Zach doesn't mean to hurt my feelings. I just show him my new magazine some other time. I'm really glad I met Zach. Of all my friends, Zach is the only one who likes model airplanes. It makes me feel good to be his friend. I know that he likes being my friend, too. Okay, that was My Friend Has Autism. And then we're going to watch one more. Um, this is called Why Johnny Doesn't Flap. Go ahead and play it. Hi, guys. Miss Mercedes here. Uh, today I'm going to be reading you why Johnny Doesn't Flap, NT is OK, written by Clay and Gail Morton, illustrated by Alex Mary. This is my friend, Johnny. We have a lot of fun together, but sometimes he acts pretty strangely. Mom says it's because he is NT, or neurotypical, he doesn't have autism, so his brain works differently from mine, and that's okay. Johnny is supposed to come to my house at 4, but sometimes he comes at 3.58 or 4.03. I gave him a watch for his birthday to help him arrive on time, but he still has this problem. He may be hopeless when it comes to punctuality, but we still get to spend time together and have fun, so that's okay. When he comes into the house, sometimes he wants to play checkers first and then play crazy eights. Sometimes he wants to play crazy eights first. He doesn't know how to follow the same order every time. But we still get to play all our favorite games, so that's okay. When he talks to you, Johnny looks directly into your eyes, which can make you pretty uncomfortable. He doesn't mean any harm, though. That's just the way he is, and that's okay. Johnny watches the same television shows that I do, but he never recites the opening credits word for word. In fact, I'm not sure he even has them memorized. He sure picks funny things to focus on, but that's okay. When something exciting happens, Johnny doesn't respond like you would expect. He doesn't flap his arms or jump up and down. He just moves the sides of his mouth up slightly and widens his eyes. Maybe he doesn't know much about how to express emotions, 
but that's okay. Johnny doesn't have a topic that he knows everything about, like World War II or dinosaurs or hydraulic forklifts. I try to share in-depth information with him, but he seems uninterested. He may never be a real expert at anything, but he's a good person, so that's okay. Johnny functions very well at school. He understands the rules and gets all of his work done. But if you ask him for basic information about the school building, like what companies manufactured the elevator, intercom, and security system, he will stare at you blankly. He understands some things, but has trouble with other things. That's true of all of us, and that's okay. Johnny never has a meltdown when disasters happen, like a fire drill or art class being canceled. He's afraid of what people might think. It seems like he's bottling up his feelings, but he just has his own way of dealing with things. And that's okay. Johnny has problems with communication. He will say that a math test was a piece of cake when he really means that it was easy. I try to explain to him that cake has nothing to do with an easy math test, but he never seems to understand that he should say what he means. I can always figure out his strange state statements eventually, though, so that's okay. Johnny's telling him it's raining cats and dogs. Is it actually raining cats and dogs, though? On the playground, Johnny always wants to play with other kids. He never goes off into his own world. Sometimes I wonder if he ever gets a chance to sit and think about his favorite commercials or the recorded message on the subway. Maybe he's a little too obsessed with social interaction, but that's okay. It can be pretty interesting being friends with a kid who is NT. He has a lot of quirks that can be very frustrating until you get used to them. Mom says that everyone's brain is different, and different isn't always wrong. I like Johnny. I think that being NT is okay. And that is the end of Why Johnny Doesn't Flap, NT is OK by Clay and Gail, Gail Morton. Thanks for listening, guys. Tune in next time. All right. So two books um, that talks about autism. I'm going to pull up my presentation just a moment. And let's talk about it. So I, I'm hoping that we can all sort of jump in here and just have a bit of a conversation about these two books, two different approaches to children's books about autism. Um, was there anything that anyone wants to, what are some takeaways from the activity? Where can you imagine incorporating these books into your own work? How might you use any of these books to spark conversation about disability or invite critical thinking about inclusivity, belongingness, access, fairness, diversity, or anything else? And you can there, a, Okay. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Diana. There, there's say, a comment the that, that says this book is really helpful for me because I'm a college student who has autism. And I believe that was referring to the second book. Awesome. So, with, 
anyone want to share any thoughts or comments about either of the books or anything that you noticed? And I, I don't know if everyone is familiar with, um, with, with, I mean, they were talking about NT a lot and that means neurotypical. So um, I should have actually started by sort of explaining that. I mean, neurotypical is the term given um, by the autistic community to non-autistic people. So the neurodiverse community, the autistic community refers to non-autistic people as neurotypical. We have a raised hand, Yana. Hi, thank you. You guessed my name, <laughs> pronunciation of my name. Thank you. Um, so I see um, what I'm noticing most is that the first book is really kind of othering or kind of saying things um, in a pretty negative way to me. And I have two autistic children and I am autistic myself so to me it is a very different uh, feeling when you're hearing that narrative as it's an issue um, and maybe I am a little more sensitive than other people but I, it just feels like uh, the norm is put on the neurotypical uh, child right where the other book the norm shifted to be the the autistic child that's i noticed that and i i would i would go for the second book if it was me and then um i don't i'm not sure if i'm really answering the questions here but <laughs> that's what it triggered in me yeah no thanks for sharing that yana um and 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 yeah i think you you hit it right on the head i mean that, that's basically the idea i mean the first one uh centers normalcy in the in the child without autism, right? Um, the second book is centering normal as the autistic child um, who is, and by the way, I, and I, I, I do this a lot, like I look at books all the time and that's, you know, my passion. Um, that second book, I mean, there's tons of books, children's books about autism that are very similar to the first one. Um, and, and there's many positives about the first one as well, to be fair, there's some things that, I also frowned it a little bit about, but the second one, um, Why Johnny Doesn't Flap, is to date the only book I have ever seen that flips the narrative. It's a little bit tongue in cheek, right? Um, it just completely flips the narrative and almost a little bit of dark humor, I think. And it's sort of doing what, what neurotypical people have been doing forever, saying, you know, it's, it's okay to be friends with disabled children. And it's, it's I, I have a dark sense of humor myself. I really enjoy that second book because it almost flips the narrative and it's like, you know, this kid who's not autistic, I mean, we can still be his friend, that's okay. And I've, I've not seen any other book that approaches the topics from this angle. This Amika's thing. raised her hand. I think that those books should be played both in the most restrictive seclusion um, and also in your general ed setting where you do invite your special education students in. Um, and, and the reason I would say that is from a personal standpoint, my daughter has been in seclusion as well as the general education and I'm also an advocate. So I've seen it where you've got these students going into the classroom and the kids are like, oh my gosh, whispering. Why do they do that? What's going on? What, what is this person? And they don't understand. And that's why I wrote, they don't have the language to say, this kid is doing this. They're not understanding why this is going on. And whereas my daughter, if we don't script it, well, I do this. Why don't they do that? Why don't they do that? So she's not understanding why the NT student or neurotypical student doesn't do any of the things she does. And she's amazingly bright. We're not taking anything away from her, but she's not understanding. And that's the other thing, you know, people don't understand with these students is with their IQ. Their IQ, there's different levels to all this. My daughter is autistic with several comorbidities. Um, 
And so she's got an IQ way up here, but she's got several other comorbidities, including the social emotional aspect of it that puts her at a six year old level and she's 10. So she doesn't understand why little Johnny over here doesn't do any of the things that she does. And so I think this would be great when you are emerging things. So from my background, um, I do think, I can see definitely where Yana is coming from. So sorry, Yana, I, I can see your point of view on that, but I have a horrible dark sense of humor on the inside. I did laugh at that because, you know, it's funny. Everybody is always, you know, looking at it from the outside in, it's flipped. Yeah. And, and Jamika, you're so right. Um, we, I mean, that my earlier point was exactly what you're saying. Like we just, we're not talking about these things to kids. We just don't talk to them about it. They have questions, they have curiosities on both ends, right? <laughs> both kids you're saying are thinking like, why, why do these kids not do that? And we're just doing a disservice to children by not talking about it. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, the, the title says it all to me, the second one, why Johnny doesn't flop. Actually, there's a lot to be unpacked there that we could spend all night. We have spent decades trying to treat autistic children, right? Using ABA therapy and reinforcers and rewards. And is anybody stopping to think, why should they not flap, first of all, right? I have been to ABA programs where I, where I see, you know, reinforcers given, I put hands down, here's a reward. Ha quiet hands, hands down, ha you know, and I'm like, Let's rethink this. What on earth is terrible about flapping? Is it really a detriment to the child who's autistic? Or is it just uncomfortable to non-disabled people? And so many other actions of disabled children that we try to stifle. It's called the normalizing of children. If it's not hurtful or harmful to anyone, the spinning, the stimming, the rocking, the moving, the swaying, why, what are we doing to children? And that's what I love about that title. Here's the kid saying, why on earth does Johnny not flap? That's the question here. Yeah, there's a com, oh. oh I was ahead, gonna Jen. just pass it to you, Daniel. Is there any comments yeah. that you wanted uh, to highlight? Yeah, uh, uh, comment in the chat. Um, uh, as a parent of a child with Down syndrome, it bothers me when people assign certain characteristics to all people with Down syndrome. Both books do this to some degree, assuming certain things are, are true of all autistic learners, which I thought was pretty interesting. Yeah, I, I can totally, I can totally see that. Um, and um, Jen, in Jen's introduction of me, she did not mention that I actually am also a parent of a child with a disability, and my daughter, who's now 20, has Down syndrome as well. So I, I totally can identify with that, you know, this idea that all kids with Down syndrome are so sweet and loving. Um, I don't know if we've had a, had a dollar for every time we were told that, right? Um, so yeah, you know, it, it is problematic to... to put any group of people together, disabled or not. Um, and I think it is, but so that's what we need to start thinking about as adults that, you know, I didn't introduce these books to suggest that we should be reading these two kids. We should be reading these two kids. But the question is that these, these books are great to spark conversations and all these comments um, can be great conversation starters. Well, our, all people like that? Well, do you, what, do you think this? Are you like that? Are all your friends this way? Um, what do you think about the idea of, um, you know, a person flapping or not flapping and stereotypes? Um, so these questions that we are asking each other, I'm inviting you to consider that at age appropriate levels, we can even invite children to consider these. And then there's a comment from um, a parent um, that says, my child has students in her class. So I suggested the second book to her teacher, preschool, kinder, 
she said it wasn't worth it because the kids wouldn't understand. And it was quite disheartening that she didn't even want to introduce it, which pretty much proves your point from earlier. Oh, oh gosh, I don't, I don't even know what to say here on this recording. Um, so I won't, but um, the, the the response you got that the children won't understand, so there's no point reading it, seems to contradict the very idea of teaching itself. Um, sure, they might not understand it. I mean, that's why you're using this to spark a conversation, to use it as a springboard, to invite children to learn something new. So, um, you know, I, I'd push back. I'd push back if I were you and say, you know, yeah, maybe they won't. Maybe that's why we should have this conversation, um, maybe offer to go in and read it. I don't know. I'd push back if I were you. Yeah, the parent adds that it's the concept of least dangerous assumption too. Yeah, yeah, which, which is sort of pervasive across the whole inclusive education conversation, right? Yeah, I mean, why are we assuming that we shouldn't do something because a group of children won't understand it? Yeah, I, I love the connection that, I don't know who, who made that comment, but about least dangerous assumption. That's exactly it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then one parent uh, finds these, both of the books are really good examples uh, to illustrate points made earlier in the presentation. And the second book was a refreshing change from typical children's books about disability. Which is absolutely true. <laughs> yeah, and one thing I noticed, I know there's a couple of hands up as well, but in the first book, um, which, which has, certainly has a lot of good merits and, and some problematic things as well. Um, but I noticed, and I haven't noticed this before, but when I was just watching it now, but the child with autism never seems to smile at all across that first book. He's, he's always got like a, a bit of a sad face. Like, so it's kind of like a, Hmm. Poor kid, kind of thing. Yeah, there, there was a um, a parent who made that same comment uh, here mm -hmm. about uh, always having a sad face. Mm -hmm. So I guess that is uh, yeah. So we have one hand up, Kyla. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to comment. Um, I teach special education, and my students are K through one. And I go in every year and read stories because we do inclusion and we have discussions around the students that will be in my classroom and the gen ed students. And they totally understand. That just broke my heart to hear that the teacher said the kids wouldn't understand because they do notice the difference, but they're just curious. They want to know why and they want to know why the child's using an AAC device and how they can help them. And you really should advocate that they read that a story to, you know, get a better understanding because they totally understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Kyla. Absolutely. Jen, how are we doing on time? Yeah, I I'm just noticing um, there is a comment about young people being um, and children being often more understanding and more flexible than the adults. And then I saw um, a hand up, Michelle, and I think then we can move on to our other content. Thanks, this is Michelle. I just wanted to say that when my son was in fourth grade, um, we asked the teacher if we could come in uh, to the general ed class where my son was spending some time um, maybe half hour to 45 minutes a day and um, an opportunity for us to share about his, his disability. And she allowed us 45 minutes. At the end of 45 minutes, she canceled her next programming and let us stay for an hour and a half because every single child had a question. And that just warmed my heart. I agree that the kids do understand they just want more information. They want to feel safe to ask those questions. It was beautiful. And I, I as a mom, love questions. <laughs> Sorry. 
Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, 100%. I, I've done that as a mom as well. And I've, I've gone in and um, that has been the basis of all, you know, the, the work that I've done. I mean, I, I used to go in and, and children, you said it exactly right, creating a safe space for children to feel comfortable to ask, because they do have a lot of questions, but they've internalized that they're not supposed to ask and it's not polite. I mean, I got questions like, is it contagious? Will she die? Can she die? Like people, they, and they were holding all this anxiety, I guess, all this time. You know, like, are you born with it? Can I catch it? Do you get sick from it? Will she die? Does she always have it? Um, and I mean, they, they're great. They're wonderful questions, right? And it, it really is about creating a space for the kids to be able to ask. Thank you. Yes. And, you know, I just noticed, like, even in this activity for us as adults, like it sparks conversation, you know, in our own understanding about um, disability and, you know, approaches, you know, with young children that the topic of um, applied behavioral analysis came up. So, I mean, it's discussing and having those opportunities to talk about these things that are really important for us to, to look, you know, identify the master narratives and um, you know, establish counter narratives um, on these topics. So um, I do want to just be mindful of time, um, and I really appreciate everybody's thoughtful um, questions and comments. And we are very fortunate in Washington State um, for a couple of reasons. So in 2008 our Washington State Legislature passed a law declaring October as Disability History Month. Sorry, my, my son is competing with me on a microphone. Uh, so schools actually, it's mandated that schools teach about disability history in the month of October. And that was passed in 2008. And now it's uh, 2022. And not all, you know, families are aware of this. Um, it's not clear to what degree this gets implemented across our state, but it's important to know that. The second thing is that um, the Office of the Education Ombuds has a wonderful curriculum that was developed. It's called One Out of Five. It was designed with the Office of the Education Ombuds in partnership with Rooted in Rights and two local educators, um, Adina Rosenberg and Sarah Arvery. So, um, you could go to the Office of the Education Ombuds website and access these resources for free. And I have done this as a parent myself, not, not only to educate me, but also you know, bring it as a resource to my son's school. Very um, user-friendly to learn about disability um, history and pride. And there's wonderful student voice videos embedded in the curriculum. So resource for Washington State. It's, it's really great that we have it. Um, so at this point, you know, we love just to like tap into our collective learning and have, you know, respond to a call to action. So based on what you learned today, what are some steps that you are going to take? Um, and we're going to share that with each other in the chat. You could just put your ideas there. We'll scroll, scroll through and identify a couple. And really, um, you know, based on our last time with Priya, when we were talking about the difference between individual advocacy and collective advocacy, you know, how can we work in solidarity with one another to work against ableism, to um, identify what the master narratives are and, you know, implement a counter narrative to those Things. So I'm going to give everybody a, a moment to go ahead and think about that. You can drop it in the chat. Um, what are some next steps that you might want to take? There, there is a comment um, about my next step is to look at some materials around my classroom and see if they tell the master narrative or the counter narrative. So this is from an educator.
being able to hold districts accountable for failing to do so, holding them accountable for failing to properly include children in inclusion when the demand is there. So feel free to keep dropping, you know, thinking about it and drop anything else in the chat. I see um, another one. I will ask both our, our both our both of our principals in the local PTA what is being planned for next October. Absolutely. It's legislated in Washington State. <laughs> so yes, and um, you know, if you are part of the PTA um, parent teacher organization, you know, maybe PTAs can be working together. Um, to promote something as well, and other um, family-led youth groups as well. Um, you know, something I'm thinking about too is just checking out what is in my son's library at school. Like, what is you know the the books that are available that address disability, and you know, can I offer feedback on those things? Um, I have another. I see another comment. I would make my school. Whoops, my, my chat just moved. I would make um, my school to have a day for accepting all disabilities and working with friends and other marginalized groups and supporting each other to improve school for all. Yes, absolutely. Thank you everyone for sharing your next steps and thinking about these topics um, for sure. And uh, we just have you know a few more minutes um, if you're thinking, if you had any questions lingering for Priya, um, Dr. Lavani, you can go ahead and pop them in the chat. Um, I see, you know, parents sharing that they donated a book about autism to the K-8 library before the pandemic. Of course, yeah, that's another way, like identify good sources and donate them. Uh, meeting with your local school board, it's good for the higher ups to hear it. Yes making um, public comment. I'm a regular at my son's school board meetings myself to make public comments on a variety of topics that impact students. And yes, going, oh, and reading Dr. Lavani's book. Yes, she's got a couple of them. They're really, they're really great um, books, great information. There is a question. Um, I have a when a college student has autism and ADHD, what can they do to prepare for finals and be able to cope with stress? I mean, so I'm a college professor, so I guess I should uh, answer that. Um, so for one, um, I, I'm not sure about how it all works in your state. I imagine the same way, but um, at our university, the first thing that I tell students who have disabilities is register first with our Disability Resource Center uh, and register for the accommodations that you rightfully are entitled to at the university. So you should be outlining a plan for yourself with your, the office at the university. And um, then you, my advice to you is at every class that you register for, you know, have a conversation with your professor. Um, some professors are really open to it and will be very accommodating and Unfortunately, I have encountered situations actually where um, professor was less than willing and um, there have been stories of professors saying things like, oh, you know, they're just making it up or whatever. So you need to know that reasonable accommodations at a university is absolutely um, your right. Um, so you need to have that A documentation first, but B, that's not going to be enough. I think you should also approach each professor and outline a plan for you what can be helpful to reduce your stress and anxiety and to, to organize your time um, and work with that. Maybe be, be transparent about it, about what you need. Um, yeah, and ask for it. All right, thank you, Dr. Lavani. So um, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up and I see lots of notes of appreciation. Um, so here are some resources for you, there is the OSPI Inclusive Practices Project, which features an interactive map. So you could find out, well, what is my school district doing? How are they connected to this project? Um, I mentioned earlier at the very beginning, I'm part of the Family Engagement Collaborative. You can visit our website for resources 
to um, help you on your journey to um, make your school more inclusive. There's also a resource for educators. Um, it's called Ed for All. Lots of um, professional development opportunities and, and ways to get connected there. And then I'm going to also just mention again the Educational Justice Roadmap, which the uh, Washington Education Association and the National Education Association funded, which um, kind of outlines the high points of making um, public education inclusive, more inclusive for all students, particularly those who have experienced um, the greatest de degrees of marginalization um, in public education. Uh, also, if you need clock hours, you can please email Jinju Park. Um, her, we can pop her email into, oh, she already did that, um, into the chat. And we also have a survey for you. Um, I have the references that um, Dr. Lavani um, used in her presentation is available if you want to do your own reading. And then um, Dr. Lavani, do you want to talk about these quotes? Okay, sure. They're, they are my favorite quotes. Um, the first one from um, Basil Bernstein is, inclusive education is an assumed precondition for a democracy. And by that, um, he means that, I mean, we talk about democracy, right, a lot and, you know, democratic education practices. And really, we have to start thinking about the idea that if we want a democratic society, there is no way we are going to get there. A truly democratic society starts with inclusive school systems because schools should mirror the society that you want to have. Um, and then um, Judge John Jerry um, versus in the Liberty v. Board of Education stated, inclusion is a right, not a special privilege for a select few. And those are words to live by. Thank you so much. Yes, and thank you once again to everybody who was able to join us today. Um, this last slide shows our contact information. And I do wanna give a special shout out to Amy, our captioner. I forgot to do that in our last um, time together, but thank you, Amy, for all your work in um, captioning our presentation today. And I just wanna um, thank you all for joining so much. And I hope you have a good evening. And if you watch this, recording at a later time, um, feel free to reach out to any of us um, as you're on your journey to make your community, your schools more inclusive. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. <laughs>